you're on. Well, this is the Holy Bible. Hallelujah. Right? This is the Bible we all carry and all cherish. But what do we mean when we say that this is the Holy Bible? What does that mean? Well, I think first that we can unpack the words themselves. Uh, the word holy means to be set apart. For something to be holy, it must be distinguished from the rest. Uh, that is, if it's set apart from God, then it is holy. And the word Bible simply means book. So when we are saying holy Bible, the holy Bible, we are actually just saying the set apart book, the book that is different from all the rest. But what makes the Bible special and set apart? Uh, what makes the Bible holy? Quite simply, the Bible is holy because it is the Word of God. And all Christians believe this. And here at my church at Glad Tidings, in our statement of faith, we say this. We say, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God given by divine inspiration, and it is the only authoritative source of doctrine and practice for Christians. I bet you uh, most churches that people are part of has something very similar in their statement beliefs that something that they believe that the word the bible is the word of god and it is authoritative because of that so to us christians the bible is to be held in high esteem it is not just some ordinary book and this book is the very word of god to us now because we believe that that, that it is god's word it is it is god's word to us Many Christians believe that we should hold respect and show respect for the physical book itself, the physical book that we hold in our hands. So I'll ask a few questions. Do you feel comfortable writing in your Bible? What about, <laughs> place, what about placing your Bible on the ground? Or what about taking your Bible into the bathroom? Uh -huh. Now, we might have different opinions on this, but these actions, to, to some cultures at least, would be highly disrespectful towards the Bible, towards God's Word. Now, what about this? What if I were to do this? Yeah. Oh, what do you do? <laughs> right? What if I were to do this? Uh. Is that not disrespectful to the mm. Bible? Thank In a sense, did I not just deface God's Word, the Word of God? Now, before my pastor's license gets revoked, <laughs> I want you to stick with me. And I want you to stick with, stick with me through this message. I hope that you'll see that what I just did actually is upholding our high view of the Bible and is in no way disrespectful. So let's just let's explore the area of inspiration. What does it mean that the Bible is inspired by God? Let's briefly explore a passage of Scripture, actually just one verse. Let's all turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. What do we mean when we say that the Bible is God's word. We're going to have the Apostle Paul explain that in 2 Timothy 3.16. Now, I can see you guys a lot better this week, so uh, just give me a, a wave when, you, uh, when you're there at 2 Timothy 3. Thank you. Okay, so it says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All scripture is inspired by God Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So here Paul declared that all scripture is inspired by God. What does that phrase, what does that phrase inspired by God mean? Well, it's a translation of a single Greek word that can be literally rendered as breathed out from God. Mm. To be inspired mm. by God is to be breathed out from God. In other words, the scriptures are the very essence of God himself. The Bible is how he speaks to us, is how he reveals himself to the world. In the Bible, we learn what God is like and what he expects of us. Now, for these and many other reasons, we Christians can confidently trust that all scripture is profitable, as Paul said, for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, which is these words, these, these phrases, are really just Paul's way of explaining what he meant when he said that all scripture is inspired by God. So let's briefly take a look at it. Firstly, he said profitable, that the scripture is profitable for these things. But what does that mean? It means being useful, 
not in the sense that it is one of many sources, but that it is useful, it is the useful source. That being, the scripture being profitable is the useful source for us. In what ways? Well, the scriptures are our source for teaching, firstly, which refers to the various doctrines of the Bible. In other words, without the scriptures, we wouldn't know what God wants us to believe, right? So in the scripture, we learn what God wants us to believe, what, what teaching he wants us to know. Now, secondly, the Bible is our source for reproof. That is, it informs us on how we can identify and then deal with error. And then thirdly, along the same lines, the word of God is our source for correction, which refers to not identifying error like the last one, but instead bringing restoration to those in error. So you see how they work together. Mm -hmm. One identifies the error and then actually restores you and corrects you in that error. <laughs> and finally, in Paul's list here, the scriptures are our source for training in righteousness, which is a reference to, let's say, let's call it practical righteousness. If you want to know how to live a godly life, then the word of God will give you the answers. So, the Bible is God's way of communicating with us all that he wants us to know. The Bible is the most important book in the world. However, uh, let, me, let me explain this, that we need to remember that the Bible that we hold in our hands is not really the Bible. In fact, most people have never even read the Bible. You know, you know the answer to that, why, why people, most people have not read the Bible? is because the Bible is really the original manuscripts, which were written in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek. So what we hold in our hands is an attempt to take the Bible, the original Bible, and transmit it to us in a language that we can all understand. Mm, so true. here in the Western world, each Bible translation into English is an attempt to take the text of the original language and translate it into a form that can be more easily read by, by English speakers like us. So, we have the translation of the Bible, the original manuscripts and, and the copies that we have translated and transmitted to us here in our physical Bibles that we hold. But there's more to the physical Bibles that we hold than simply a translation of the, a translation of the text of the Bible. Like, I don't think we ever take the time to, to really focus in on this. I think we gloss over it all the time. That in the original manuscripts, there, there weren't title pages. There weren't any chapter and verse divisions. There weren't any paragraph breaks. And for the most part, there wasn't even punctuation. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think that in some cases, there may have been minimal things of this nature. But for the most part, the text of the original, uh, of, 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 the, of the manuscripts, are fairly uh, just straightforward, the text itself, just the words themselves. So all of these added elements were added by translators in order to make the Bible more readable and easier to understand. I certainly appreciate opening up the Bible and, and seeing those chapter divisions. It, it helps us to be able to tell others where in the Bible to go and to get for, for them to be able to get there more quickly. However, they, these have all been added to Bible. Now, while these elements can be helpful in some ways, we have to understand that these elements can possibly influence the way we read and understand the Bible. Mm. Let's take, for example, one verse. Let's all turn to Luke chapter 23, verse 43. I think this is going to be a verse that you guys will recognize because it's something that's used uh, by some of our uh, our colleagues in Christianity to show us that we're wrong in certain areas. So Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Let's all say amen when we reach there. Amen, amen, amen. So this is the time in, in the Bible when Jesus was on the cross and he had the two criminals on each side and the criminal, one of the criminals next to him says, truly, rather, one of the criminals next to him you know, repents of his sin and recognizes who Jesus is and asks him to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And what does the text say here in Luke 23? Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. And from this verse, a lot of Christians have been led to believe that when you die, you immediately go to heaven, which is here called paradise. 
However, according to our understanding of the Bible, we believe that death is like sleep, and we will all remain asleep until the resurrection, mm -hmm. at which point we will be brought back to life, and, and then we will enjoy the paradise of the kingdom on earth. So, here's the thing. Since there's no punctuation in the original manuscripts, we would argue that the translator should have put the comma in a different place, and that would cause the verse to be read in a different way. So I'll, I'll, you know, I'll provide you with what, I'm, with what we would be looking at here. It, Luke 23, 43 says, Truly I say to you today, comma, you shall be with me in paradise. That changes it a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. In, in that way, Jesus is saying, Truly I say to you today, and what is he going to say? You shall be with me in paradise. The implication being, one day you shall be with me in the paradise of the kingdom. So some people, if, like if we give that teaching and some people would then come up to us afterwards and maybe they would accuse us of saying, hey, you're messing with the Bible to fit your theology. And to that we'd simply say, well, there was no punctuation in the original manuscripts, so placing that comma in there is a choice that the translators have to make. And so they chose one place and we're choosing a different place. And because we believe that is helping the verse be more understandable in light of what the rest of the Bible teaches. So, as you can see, the added elements that are in our English Bibles can be helpful, but they can also lead us astray if we're not careful. So let's look at another added element, another added element that are the things that are added to our physical Bibles. What about the title pages before the book of Genesis and before the book of Matthew, right? In most Bibles, before the book of Genesis, you'll find a title page that says Old Testament. And before the book of Matthew, you're going to find a title page that says New Testament, right? I'm mm -hmm. sure we all know that. But have we all, do we all know and have we ever wondered why and from where these title pages came? Why do we call the books from Genesis to Malachi the Old Testament? And why do we call the books of Matthew to Revelation the New Testament? In fact, some would say that we should divide the Bible in this way in order to remind ourselves that things changed when Jesus died, right? At that point in Scripture, Jesus died, things changed. There is a great divide between before Jesus and after Jesus. Mm, amen. So this is what they would say. This is the, the line of thinking that is so common among many Christians, that before Jesus, God's people were Israel, and they were under the old covenant of law. But now, after Jesus, God's people are the church, and we are under the new covenant of grace. But today, we're gonna, I'm going to ask each of you to, to challenge yourselves and to hear what I'm saying. I have to ask this question. Is that line of thinking really true? Should we really think that there is a great divide before between how things were before Jesus and how things are after Jesus. My opinion is I don't believe so. I believe that all scripture is inspired by God, meaning that the Bible is a unified book for all of God's people. Mm. I believe that so strongly that I feel comfortable ripping up those title pages, which is why <laughs> I did not rip out any part of the actual Bible. I ripped out those title pages. Ah, okay. To me, those title pages are not the Bible. The writers of Scripture didn't put them there. The translators did. Again, maybe they had a pure motive to do so. But I think that dividing up Scripture in that way is actually a mistake. Hmm. That, that it simply perpetuates some mistaken beliefs. And these beliefs cause many Christians to assume that there is a great divide between before the time of Jesus and after the time of Jesus. But I don't think so. So let's carefully explore a few of these mistaken, in my opinion, mistaken beliefs, and then you can make your own conclusion. Let's see if indeed there is some great divide in Scripture, or perhaps the Bible is a unified one, and that it is for all of God's people. Now, I just want us to remember, Paul, the text we looked at, Paul said that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for us in many ways. So I want us to remember that as we're going through each belief. We're going to look at three different areas of belief. We're going to, I'm going to challenge them and hopefully show you that there's a reason to challenge them. And perhaps we should rethink a few of our beliefs. The first area is this, that the common thinking among Christians is that before Jesus, salvation was by the law. 
then, and then after Jesus, salvation was by grace. So let's explore this area of salvation. Before Jesus, how were people saved? Have you ever wondered that? How were people saved before the coming of Jesus and his first coming? Many Christians believe, or at least assume, that before Jesus, the, the, the people of faith had to merit their salvation by obeying God's law. Then Jesus came, and Jesus' death ushered in a new era of grace, which replaced the old way of salvation, which was by the law. Instead of having to obey the law and, and having to merit salvation in that way, sinners could now gain atonement by responding to God's grace, which was manifested when Jesus died for us. And, and this, i got to say, this mentality is perhaps led into Romans chapter 6, verse 14. I'm sure we all have heard it at one time or another. Paul said in Romans 6, 14, you are not under law, but under grace, right? You're not under law, but under grace. And people assume that's what he's referring to here is that before Jesus, people were saved by keeping the law, and then after Jesus, they were saved by God's grace. However, there is a critical problem with believing that God saved people through the law before Jesus. It makes Jesus' death and his resurrection superfluous and unnecessary for salvation. Let's think about this. If God was able to save sinners through obedience to the law, then why did Jesus have to die for our sins? I mean, if sinners could be saved through the law, then that would have meant that God could have continued to accept people based upon their obedience. And he didn't have to require Jesus to suffer and die. But the reality is, is that no one has ever been saved by the law. Paul said in right. Galatians 2.21, he said, if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Mm. So, God didn't save people differently prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus. The, so, how were they saved? Well, the people of faith before Jesus, the prior to the coming of Jesus, they weren't saved by keeping the law. They were saved the same way we are. They were saved through God's grace, based upon the, what to them was the coming death of Jesus. Those who lived before the time of Jesus had to place their faith in God and trust in him that he would fulfill the promises that he's made to them, and particularly that he would send the Messiah to atone for their sin. So let's take the best example in scripture, and that is the father of our faith. We are of the Abrahamic faith. So let's look at Abraham. What did Jesus say about Abraham? He said in John 8, 56, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And you know what? Even Paul taught in Galatians 3 that Abraham was saved by faith. In fact, he says, he went on to teach that Abraham is the quintessential believer, that according to the apostles, our faith should be like the faith of Abraham. And that means that we can look to Abraham and the other great men and women of faith in the Hebrew scriptures and we can take inspiration. This is why Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, you know what, this is such a unique and interesting verse. Let's turn to it. 2 Timothy, Timothy 3.15. This is so interesting how Paul is telling and reminding Timothy that, that we can look to the people of faith in the Hebrew Scriptures because they provide for us the model of how to be saved. Let's all give away when we, when we reach there. Okay. So Paul said to Timothy, from child, 2 Timothy 3.15, from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So he's reminding Timothy, Timothy, you know the Hebrew scriptures. You know the Bible, the, the Bible that was available to them at the time. And you know all the great men and women of faith that are in, the, in the, the sacred writings, as he calls it. And you know that they provide for us a model of faith, that, that those writings have given you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that the Hebrew scriptures teach that salvation comes through faith in Christ Jesus, in a manner of speaking. Obviously, the Hebrew scripture doesn't name Jesus, but it provides us with the model of what we are to do to get saved, right? To humbly accept what God has done for us. And then, as we know, because we just looked at it a few minutes ago, Paul then says in the very next verse, 
And all scripture is inspired by God. Right? We looked at that earlier. All scripture is inspired by God. In other words, the Bible is a unified book. It, the whole Bible teaches us that salvation is by God's grace, which we receive by faith in Christ Jesus. Which means no matter where we read in the Bible, the message is going to be the same. That we have to actively trust in God, we have to respond to his grace, and then in obedience we must persevere to the end. And if we do so, we will receive eternal life. So when it comes to this first issue, the issue of salvation, I don't think that there's any need to see a great divide mm -hmm. between before Jesus and after Jesus. Amen. Because I believe that Amen. all believers, both before and after his coming, have, been, have, have looked to him for salvation. We all look to Jesus for salvation. Amen. So let's move on and look at the second area, the second belief that people have, another common belief, and that is actually it's a justification for thinking that there is a great divide between before Jesus and after Jesus, and that is the fact that before Jesus there was the old covenant, and then after Jesus there is the new covenant. And people would say that in the death of Jesus, the new covenant was ratified. The new covenant was ratified in the death of Jesus. And I would say amen to that. Jesus said in Luke 22, verse 20, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We all know that verse. We probably all quote it every time we partake of communion. That Jesus, uh, he said that this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So, indeed, without the blood of Jesus, that is his death, God would not be able to forgive sins and put into effect the new covenant. So, Jesus is absolutely necessary. The death of Jesus is absolutely necessary in order to have the new covenant. However, I must say that this is different from saying that the reality of the new covenant promises was were realized immediately after Jesus' death, right? If we know what the new covenant is, you would have to admit that the reality of the new covenant were not was not fully realized immediately after Jesus' death. So let me just frame, frame it this way. That people tend to assume that when Jesus died in his first coming, that he then brought about the reality of the new covenant. And he put an end to the era of the old covenant. In fact, that's the main reason why we call the books of Matthew to Revelation the New Testament, as opposed to the Old Testament, because the word testament is, real, is, is just the Latin way of saying covenant. So we are saying that after Jesus, we are in the era of the new covenant. But I have to ask this, are we yet living in the era of the new covenant? What is the new covenant itself? Well, to answer that, we need to remember that God has made several covenants with the people of Israel. Firstly, the covenant made with Abraham, the covenant he made with the entire nation of Israel at Mount Sinai, and then the covenant with David. And in these covenants, God promised that he promised many things, but among them are this, that Israel would possess the land of Israel forever, that Israel would receive blessing if they were obedient to his commandments, and that the son of David, the Messiah, would be king over them. Now, to this day, none of these promises have been fully realized. None of these covenant promises have been fully realized. However, according to Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, God promises to make a new covenant with Israel in which he will change their hearts, forgive them of their sins, cause them to be obedient to his ways, and thus receive all of the blessings promised to them in the previous covenants. So let's think about this for a moment. Which of the covenants that I listed earlier, which of them are the old covenants? You have the Abraham covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, and the Davidic Covenants. They're all waiting to be fulfilled. The promises that are in those covenants are all waiting to be fulfilled. And then you have the New Covenant, which, we, which will be fully realized when Jesus returns, and all the promises of the previous covenants will be fully realized in the New Covenant. So I, I personally think that there is no Old Covenant, if you, want to, if you want to look at it that way. That all of the covenants have a view to the New Covenant, and the new covenant fully realizes all the previous covenants. Mm, right. So I That's think this is the way all believers have been looking at it, in, in a sense. That both before and since Jesus, we are all waiting for the new covenant to be fully realized. 
which will finally happen when Jesus returns. Now, in the meantime, don't get me wrong, we can take a hold of the new covenant reality in our lives. All true believers, both before Jesus and after Jesus, we've all had a taste of that new, co new covenant reality. And God gives us a portion of his spirit, which is an assurance that we will be resurrected and we will be given immortality and we will be freed from sin. And, but this is all looking forward to that full reality when Jesus returns and God promises to fulfill all the promises he made to the people of Israel. Now, so it's true that Jesus' death ratified and made possible the coming new covenant reality, but the new covenant reality is not yet here. And what this means is, is that all of the true believers, both before Jesus and after Jesus, we've all gotten to taste the coming new covenant reality. So we tend to think that the people before Jesus had a different experience than we do. Well, certainly we are grateful for living after the first coming of Jesus when we have that revelation. But in terms of our relationship to God, they have take hold of that coming reality just as we do. Right? They look in faith to what God what was going to do, and they take hold of that by faith. So I think that it's, it's important for us to realize that the Bible is a unified book, that all believers from any era had a taste of that new covenant reality. All scripture is inspired by God, and there is no point in seeing any part of the Bible as the Old Testament, since we are all in the same position of hoping and waiting for the coming new covenant reality. Mm -hmm. Right, the last area I want us to explore, the, a common belief among Christians that I think needs to be challenged, is that some people see a great divide between the time before Jesus and the time after Jesus in the fact that primarily before Jesus, God dealt with Israel. But then since Jesus, he now deals with a new group called the church. In other words, the church is a group that is distinct from Israel. And this perspective is actually related to the other two views that we explore because it's understood that the church is saved by grace under the new covenant, whereas Israel is, was God's people, but they were saved under the, by the law under the old covenant. However, we've already seen, and I know that we're, we're coming through a lot of theology here, and I do understand that it, 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 it's a lot of things to, to take in, but I, I've tried to make the case that, we, that salvation has been always been by God's grace, and it's always been the way he saved people, and that the new covenant is a, a future agreement, a future reality between God and Israel. And so all believers have had a taste of it, that coming reality, without yet fully experiencing it. So with that knowledge, how then should we understand the church and its relationship to the people of Israel? First point I want to make about this is that according to the apostles, Israel remains God's chosen hmm, people. That's true. Romans chapter 11, verse 1, mm -hmm. Paul asked this. He said, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? His answer, may it never be. <laughs> so the apostles believed, and in fact, they themselves were living proof that Israel remained God's people. However, God was doing something quite amazing in their, in their day, something even amazing to them. He was saving Gentiles, all of us, non-Israelites. God was now going beyond the borders of Israel to save people. And he didn't, that didn't mean, however, that he was abandoning Israel and starting a new group. Instead, as Paul taught in, in the book of Ephesians, that we Gentiles, though we were disconnected from Israel before salvation, through, through Christ, we have now been brought here. Let's look at one final text this, this, this evening. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Let's all do a good amen once we reach there. Hmm. Amen. amen. All right. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Paul is saying that before hmm. faith, he had a certain reality that now after faith, have been, that reality has been changed. He said, you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, 
You who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Oh, in Jesus, what is he teaching here? In Jesus, we Gentiles can now be connected to Israel, and we can enjoy the blessings of the covenant promises, which, as I already taught, that those blessings will be realized when Jesus returns and the new covenant reality is fully realized. So, let me ask this. What is the church? What is this group that we call the church? Well, the church, as I'm sure most of you know, the church is just a term that means assembly or community. And it is a reference to the community of Jews and Gentiles who are devoted to the Messiah now, before his return. But it's important to, to realize that this church, this community, is not distinct from Israel. Especially, consider this. There are Jewish people who are in the church, so they are certainly not disconnected or distinct from Israel. They're still a part of the nation of Israel. And we Gentiles who are part of the church are united with those Jewish believers, and we, in that sense, should not think of ourselves as being disconnected from Israel, as we are united with our brothers and sisters among the Jewish people who are in the church. In fact, the Jewish people who are part of the church, they constitute, according to the apostles, what they call the faithful remnant in Israel. Paul said in Romans 11:5, there has also come to be at this present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. So in every generation, there is a faithful remnant in Israel, and this faithful remnant in each generation are those who turn to God in repentance and in faith, and they trust God that God will send the Messiah, or for those who have lived after Jesus is coming, that he is going to send the Messiah back, and that the Messiah is going to come, he's going to deal with sin, and he's going to come back and reign as king. So the faithful remnant is the church, if you want to put it that way. There's the nation of Israel, and then there's the faithful remnant, which is the church, the community of Jesus. And since the days of the apostles, we Gentiles have joined the church. In fact, we now greatly outnumber our Jewish brothers and sisters in the church. But that doesn't mean that the Jewish people are disconnected from the people of Israel, or the entire church is disconnected. That, that even though we are not Jewish, we are, as I said, we are united with our believing Jewish people who are in the church, our Jewish brothers and sisters, and that gives us a connection to the people of Israel. So the church is not a new entity that replaces Israel. Israel was and is God's people, but the church is Jesus' community within Israel, which is now spread throughout the whole world to include people from every nation. So to bring it all home, that being the case, I firmly believe that we should look at the Bible as a unified book, that we don't need to see the books that took place before Jesus as being for Israel, whereas the books after Jesus are for the church. All scripture is inspired by God, and there is not mm -hmm. some great divide. The whole Bible is for all God's people. So let me again ask this question. Is there a great divide? It's true that the first coming of Jesus was that monumental event that was absolutely necessary for salvation. Without the first coming of Jesus, without his ministry, his death, his resurrection, we could not be saved by God's grace. We, could, we won't have the new covenant reality in the future, and there would be no such thing as the church. The first coming of Jesus was absolutely essential. But the people who lived before Jesus are unified with we who live after Jesus in the sense that we all look to that event for salvation. We all look to the first coming of Jesus for salvation by grace. We all look to that first coming of Jesus for an assurance that there will be a new covenant reality in the future. So the true believers of every generation, both before Jesus and after Jesus, we make up the church, his community, because we are all looking to that first coming of Jesus for salvation. However, we are also all looking to the second coming of Jesus, when our salvation will be completed, the new covenant will finally be realized, and then the church will expand to include all of Israel, as Paul said, all of Israel will be saved, and it will also include much of the world. So, I encourage you as we close, as I close my message this evening, I encourage you to ignore, if you don't feel comfortable ripping up those pages, <laughs> at least ignore oh, those title pages <laughs> that say Old Testament and New Testament. Mm -hmm. To me, it presents a false uh, message 
They imply that we should imagine some great divide between the Hebrew Scriptures and the writings of the Apostles. That we should view the Hebrew Scriptures as antiquated, as uh, for another people. And then the writings of the Apostles are our Scriptures. I say they are, that isn't true. The whole Bible is for us. All Scripture is inspired by God. All believers of every generation are unified. And because we are all looking to what Jesus has accomplished in his first coming for salvation, and we are all looking forward to what he will do in his second coming, that gives me the confidence that there is no great divide. So I encourage you, encourage you to contemplate these things that we've explored and know it's a lot of theology. So Amen. let's close in prayer, and I'm going to ask God to help us to understand and to live these things out. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you that we have this awesome opportunity to come together over the internet that, uh, that even though we don't live in the same area, we're still united and we're still able to speak this way. Lord, I know that the things that I've spoken tonight uh, can be challenging, so I pray, God, that you would soften each heart and you would give each of us the ability to uh, calmly look at these issues and to study things out for ourselves and to come to our conclusion that, that you were leading us to. And we're so grateful, Lord, how you take care of us, how you guide us, you give us wisdom and truth. And we're so grateful for that. And we pray, Lord, that there would be a hunger and a thirst among your people to see the Bible as something that is for all of us and that, that we would be passionately living it out. We thank you for this and, and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.